name is Julian Palico. I am an 18-year-old National Master from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and today I prepared a special lecture for you this evening. Um, I guess the overarching theme is maneuvering, but uh, the recurring theme is actually the move Knight A1. I, uh, the reason why it's Knight A1 is I have a friend, uh, his name's Dennis Norman. He recently broke expert. And uh, he, has, he has this position against um, a player rated over uh, 2,000, I think, at the World Open. And he played the worst possible move, which is, well, knight a1. <laughs> and um, all right, it is, it is black to move. I'll, I'll pose this as a small problem for you. It is black to play and basically win. This doesn't win material, but it makes sure that white cannot move any of his pieces. Anybody like to suggest a move? All right, they, they are perplexed. So bishop a4 is the answer. And the knight on uh, a1 is overruled by the bishop on a4. It cannot move for the rest of the game. And actually, he lost very quickly. So after the game, he was like, well, Julian, uh, you know, knight a1 is such a bad move. I bet there is no game ever played, ever, where knight a1 was the best move or that it was a brilliant game. And uh, this entire lecture is dedicated to destroying Dennis Norman's reputation. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's move on to the Grandmaster games. So this, uh, let's just move through the opening uh, quickly because this isn't an opening lecture. Uh, this is the Nightwarf. Uh, with a6, the English attack with bishop e3. e5 is the most common move. e6 is a sideline, whatever. b3, bishop e6, e3. So h5, um, knight d5. So white tries to play positionally against uh, h5 because it gives away the g5 square. And now he's going to play with a queenside majority later. So knight b7, queen d2. This, this is not the important part. So c4, white is gaining space on the queen side. And um, instead of trying to checkmate like he does in normal lines of the English attack, he's just going to castle and play on the queen side because he has more space over there. And you play on the side that you, uh, you are strongest at. So bishop g7, castles. Castles, rook c1. And um, in this position, oh, sorry, hold on. In this position. Uh, white, sorry, b6. White has a very interesting maneuver, which uh, everybody at home should know because my my rule, which I've established as the newest lecturer at the St. Louis Chess Club, is always play knight a1, x clan. Knight a1, and uh, this is a novelty uh, played by these guys, uh, Alexi Alexi Vol. And uh, Sarah, De, uh, Sarah De Gimi, <laughs> whatever, Robert, uh, in 2013. But this idea was actually validated by Wesley So, played against Dominguez in 2014. And here, and the point of knight a1 is I want to play b4 and uh, maybe bring my knight back, or I can bring my knight to c6. And it'll be very useful on c6. And maybe uh, in some lines, it'll end up on the king side. So it's important in chess not to be so dogmatic. Like knight a1 is not a very good move in most positions. But um, you want to look, look at the whole board and, uh, and look for opportunities, even if they seem unusual or bad. So knight a1 is uh, <laughs> obviously uh, very unusual, but uh, OK, black responded the, in, the mo um, in the most normal way for this position. The point of, uh, can anybody try to explain the point of king h7 for black? King h7 for black? Wow. King h7 for black? So black has a problem in this position. Would anybody like to point out the problem? So black has pawns 
on uh, d6 and e5, which are kind of fixed. And um, I mean, he liked at some point maybe to play e4. But um, uh, if, if the pawns remain on d6 and e5, then his bishop is always going to be bad on g7. So the point of king h7 is at some point he'd like to play knight g8 and bishop h6 and trade off a pair of bishops because of um, uh, because the bishop would be pinned to the queen on, on this diagonal. So that's why black played king h7, knight c2. So remaneuvering. Unfortunately, the knight cannot remain on a1 forever. I, I mean, that's life. But, but uh, here, here it finds, it's trying to find its way to greener pastures, like c6, or maybe, uh, or maybe um, eventually g2. So knight, uh, knight g8. It's, imp uh, it's important to note, the old move here was actually g4. And uh, white was probably a little bit better in these lines after uh, knight c5 and bishop d3. He has slightly more space. Uh, sorry, he has slightly more sp space in the center. He has this pawn, which is controlling the f5 square, and he has two bishops. But that being said, Black is very solid and has pressure along the b line, and at some point can try to play a5 and a4, and there's or maybe organize f5 in, in his dreams. So like, this position is very complicated, and um, oh, there's a lot of counterplay for Black. Which is why this novelty knight a1 is actually very, very strong. So let's continue. So knight g8, the point of knight g8 obviously is to prepare bishop h6 because the bishop on g7 is bad uh, due to the uh, structure on, uh, in the center. So you play g4. So uh, hg. g4 is. Um, has two ideas. The, the first idea is you kind of um, you kind of want to make f5 less desirable. So at some point, if you play bishop d3 or like the f file, if the f file opens, then f5 is going to be harder to achieve. If you play f5 immediately, then um, uh, I'll just leave my pawns be and I'll try to uh, win on uh, win in, on the on the king side uh, through the h file or something like that. Eventually, I'll prepare f4 myself. And I have two bishops, so when the center opens up, hopefully, I'll be the one uh, with the better position. So uh, in this, the second idea, sorry, yeah, the first idea is you want to make f5 less desirable. The second one is maybe you'll try to take on h5, open the g file, and um, white's pieces will come floating in. So hg4, fg. Uh, this might be a small concession because white's rook all of a sudden becomes very active. In this position, with the pawn being on f3, the rook doesn't really do anything. But after, uh, but black was afraid of gh, so he he had to he had to play this move now. 97, 91. So uh, if we were to if we were to bring our knight to c6, uh, sorry, our knight cannot go to c6. So we have to change our plans, and this is like the whole idea of knight a1. Like, you can't be so dogmatic. You can't say, OK, well, I play knight a1 because I want to go to c6, or I want to win on the queen side. Uh, the situation can change. So now it's probably better to have your pieces on the king side because black has weakened uh, that part of the board. So knight e1, e4, knight g2, knight e5. Uh, black is. Black has played e4 because now his bishop, which, which I was criticizing the entire game, is, is kind of a monster. The bishop controls the entire diagonal. Um, although the static structure uh, would indicate that you would want to trade these bishops. So if white were to play bishop d4, then, then uh, bishop takes and queen c5, probably black is significantly better already, just because the dark squared bishops have been traded. And um, potentially he can have a protected pass pawn with f5. So white doesn't want to trade dark sword bishops, but at the same time, the, uh, black has improved the bishop on g7 uh, tremendously. So knight g2. Um, yeah, so now, now that black's weak in the king side, we, we want to put our pieces over there. So the knight has found a very nice home on g2. Maybe we're preparing h4 and h5. 
knight e5, um, black has put his knight on, an, on a very active position or active looking. But actually, in my opinion, knight e5 is a mistake. Probably what black should do is try to organize some kind of counterplay with like rook b8 and b5 or uh, f5 somehow. But after knight e5, this allows a, a, a very creative move. Um, if at home, you might want to take 20 seconds and pause and try to, try to find this move. What, what, was, uh, uh, what did black prevent before he played knight e5? Hopefully, you took some time. And the answer is rook c3. Now, the rook that came from a1 actually wants to end up here. As I said, black is weak in the king side, so we go and we put our pieces over there and attack. So we're going to bring our rook to h3. With the knight being on d7, of course, the bishop would take the rook, and black is one material. I mean, I don't know how, how much better black actually is, but an exchange is an exchange. So at least, at least he could consider bishop c3. So knight e5, rook c3. He's coming to h3, obviously. Rook b8. So now black is trying to play b5. But uh, probably it was better, better back here. What? Cancel. Sorry. 95 rook c3, rook b8, bishop d4. Queen d7. Uh, he's trying to i the g4 square, but uh, this this already doesn't 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 matter as much. I mean, the king is too weak. So rook h3 here. And um, now once again, uh, white made a very interesting decision here. What would you play here with white? At home, I would take 10 seconds. Do you have any ideas? So, so, um, so what you'd like to play is queen h6. The problem with queen h6 is bishop, is bishop h6, right? So can you force a concession from black right now? All right, I'm just going to continue. The answer is bishop takes e5. Takes, and now white has a very nice uh, a, a connected pass pawn, and also uh, he's made this bishop on g7 significantly weaker. Uh, bishop takes, obviously, is not possible because queen h6 comes with mate. You really can't stop queen h7 conveniently. Uh, the only thing you can do is give a check, and then here it's already over. Queen h7 is basically unstoppable. So, um, well, I mean, you could move the rook and get mated on f7, I guess. So take queen e1. Um, the point of queen e1 is obviously to get on the h file. And then queen e7, uh, queen h7 is annoying again. So f6. Never play f6 except, except here, because <laughs> he wants to run away. It's too little, too late. Queen h1, uh, just uh, just in case there's any check along this diagonal at some point, getting out of future tactics. And maybe at some point the rook will be useful on g1. b5, knight e3. So the knight that was on a1 actually finds itself on the be uh, best possible position. The knight on e3 is, is very, uh, very nice. If you can do this in your games, it's um, it's useful to keep in mind. When there's, when there's like a pawn on e4 or d5, if black were to play like knight c8 to d6, or in this case knight g2 to e3 and blockade these pawns, then usually um, the knight can serve as both a defensive piece, stopping the pawn from moving, and an attacking piece. Stop, uh, well, in this case, it's stopping the pawn, but in, sometimes it can go to d5 or f5. It's just very useful to blockade pawns like this. This is one of. Uh, like in the Grunfeld, this is a very common theme. And here, uh, the, the knight is. Jeez. <sighs> the knight is the uh, best piece on the board. So, um, knight e3, queen d6, b4. White is going to expand on the queen side with c5 and d6, and then d7, and c6, and c7, and c8. <laughs> All the pawns are, are storming down the board. White is winning on all sides of the board. 
he has the h file. Black can't really play f5 conveniently because that'll open up his king too much. For like, for example, after b4, if f5 is probably all over after queen h4, I'm gonna play queen h7 and take the pawn on f5 and take back. So uh, that's why bc4 was played. Knight c4 attacking the queen. Uh, queen d7. Queen b4 was not played because you get mated. S simple. So d6, knight d5, bishop d1. Uh, the point of bishop d1 is to come to b3, and once once you reach this diagonal, it's, I mean, it's basically lights out. Um, yeah, black is totally lost here already. Knight f4, bishop b3. Um, if you take the rook, obviously there's knight e5 check, winning a queen. So rook f7, rook back to c3, e3, queen e3. And actually, uh, black resigned here. Um, because I'm about to play knight a5 and win the exchange. And not only that, I'm also making a queen. <laughs> and maybe I can think about mating you on the h file later. So this game, uh, this game was pretty destructive. I mean, it's, it's clear proof that knight a1 is almost the best move in every variation. Uh, this, this was played between two grandmasters, rated about 2550. All right, now the second game I like to show is even better. It's between Magnus Carlsen and Michael Adams. Uh, and this is actually not only my favorite game where Knight A1 was played, but my favorite game of all time. It's very positional. Um, so uh, Carlsen is white. He starts with D4, Knight F6, C4, E6, Knight C3, Bishop B4. So this is the Nimzo Indian. Uh, in the classical variation with queen c2. Uh, Adams responded with d5. Um, there are many moves here with white. Carlson chose a3, bishop c3, queen c3. And then um, the whole point of this variation is obviously not to double your pawns with bc3. You protect the knight with the queen. And uh, bishop f4 attacking c7. So bishop a6 is played. This is a, a, a pawn sacrifice, which is actually very interesting. Yeah, this one. So yes, it moves this we'll away. Right All right, cool. So in this position, um, I mean, this is just theory. Lots of, lots of Grandmaster games have been played, uh, sorry, have reached this specific position. And uh, most of them have been drawn. The best move here is knight c6, e, knight f3, rook c8. And then you'll play, the idea is to play knight a5. But OK, first you play knight e4. Or sorry, castles rook b1 knight e4, e3 take take and knight a5, and this this is roughly equal because uh, white has lots of light square weaknesses on b3, c4, and c2. Black can hope to invade with his rooks, and he'll have at least enough compensation for the pawn. Um, instead, Adams played uh, castles here, which is probably slightly inaccurate. Although maybe it doesn't matter because he'll play knight c6 anyway. Um, but his, his idea was wrong. He played knight f3 and rook c8. Now, actually, this rook belongs on d8, and the rook on a8 belongs on c8. But he wanted immediate counterplay with rook c8 to c2. So he wanted to hit b2, and um, I mean, if he, wins, if he wins the pawn on b2, then black is probably already fighting for the advantage. I mean, black has more develop, development than white. So uh, if material is equal, then then he's already on the attack. Uh, sorry. So rook c8, bishop f4, knight d7. And here, Carlson recognizes that um, though he is up a pawn, he has a lot of problems. Uh, knight d7 is the wrong idea because the knight doesn't really have a good square after it goes to d7. On c6, it's going to a5, b3, and c4. And on d7, it's, it can't go to c5 or, or e5. Um, but but here, the knight on uh, f3 kind of is kind of in the way, because you'd really like to play f3 and e4, or you'd like to, um, uh, you'd like to develop your other, your other pieces. And there's, there's actually a problem here, uh, that the black is immediately playing rook c2. So he, he tries to resolve all his problems with knight d2, which is probably correct. Other interesting lines 
are, uh, f for example, king d1, knight e4, bishop g3, rook c6, e3, take, take, rook c8, knight e1, b5. And white is slightly better, but um, the position that he got in the game is better than this. So probably what he did, I mean, what he did was fine. That's, both plans are OK for white. So knight d2, rook c2, rook b1, rook c8, knight b3. And um, everybody, at, everybody at home should know the move here. It's uh, knight a1. Sorry, bishop c4, knight a1. <laughs> Which actually conveniently traps the rook, because the rook can't go back. But Adams saw this probably, and he was relying on bishop e a2. Uh, takes, takes, and uh, now, of course, uh, the knight is hit, and if it goes to like e3 or something, then rook c1, uh, and I don't know, rook back, and knight e4 to f2 is probably going to be annoying. So once again, Carlson plays knight a1. Uh, so the reason why this is the best game ever is, first of all, Carlson managed to play knight a1 twice, and he, and he didn't lose. And uh, knight a1 is the best move, and the only move that, that maintains the advantage. Knight d5, bishop d2. So uh, black kind of forced white to do something he wanted to do anyway. Probably, OK, knight d5 is fine. But white's going to play bishop d2 and e3, and then try to castle and claim he's up a pawn. But here, black played, uh, I mean, he's just kind of playing into white's hand. Knight d5, bishop d2. He OK, you want to open up the center when your opponent is poorly developed. All of white's pieces are on the, on the last rank. Um, but uh, it doesn't matter, because queens are traded, and the initiative is, is kind, of, kind of gone. So e3, take, take, rook e8, uh, oh, sorry, knight b8. Um, knight of fate is also interesting, but here white can play like bishop a6 and try to I mean, he maintains two bishops. The pawn isn't attacked yet. I can try to move my king somewhere and play knight b3, and I'm up a pawn. Uh, but knight b it's, uh, is what was played in the game. Hold on. What's going on? Train. All right. So knight b8, f3, knight c6, bishop c4. So Carlson attacks uh, the knight to try to so I mean, black just attacked a pawn, but Carlson attacked a knight. Uh, so uh, black needs to respond to that. And he, he develops with tempo, so he's going to keep his pawn. Rook d8, uh, king f2. So obviously, if you take this guy, then I'll take your bishop. And you'll probably resign. So bishop f5, knight b3. Now uh, bishop e6 was played, rook c1, f6. Now here, in this position, White played a very, very strong move. So White has, uh, has protected his pawn sufficiently. He's, um, he's put his rook on the only open file. I mean, sorry, uh, this, I mean the most <laughs> important open file. The e file doesn't really matter because the kings can, can guard it. Uh, all of his pieces kind of make sense. The knight doesn't really make sense because there's, there's pawns here stopping its, uh, its uh, future homes, but here Carlson tries to provoke a weakness, and he plays a4, which is very, very strong. Um, now this move might not like be important right now, but like 10, 10 moves from now or 15 moves from now, this is really gonna, uh, it's really gonna benefit White because if I'm allowed to play a5 and take and move my rook to the a file, then I have entry points on let's say a6 or a7. And um, if black does what he did in the game and he plays a5, then b6 all of a sudden becomes extremely weak. So Carlson has changed his game plan um, here. Now, now instead of trying to hold on to this pawn, we, what we want to do is we want to try to attack b6. And um, well, the bishop that black doesn't have is the dark squared bishop. So it's actually kind of convenient if we, would, if we were to lose our, lose our d4 pawn. So bishop c3, um, obviously black can't take because I take on e6 with check and take on c3 and black resigns. So bishop f7, knight d2, knight, knight d7, uh, bishop f1. So if you, were, if you were to play something like rook d1 and try to hold on to your pawn, I mean, obviously you can't take this. Like 
be because of uh, tactics, right? I just take and play knight b3 and win the piece on d4. But um, you're going to run into some difficulties after just bishop c4, and uh, black, black has really nice control over d5. White will never be able to advance the pawn on d4. He has excellent, excellent control of the light squares, and white's bishop is no good. So this is unclear. Probably white's a little bit better. But you have to play bishop f1 if you want to maintain your advantage. But black, black took back his pawn. But after knight takes d4, this diagonal has suddenly opened up. So black's, uh, sorry, white's pawn on d4 was actually stopping the, the dark squared bishop from being on its best possible diagonal, the g1 to a7 diagonal. So rook e1, knight c6, knight c4. So now the knight is attacking black's only weakness, knight d5. And this is another very important moment. Uh, black is about to take on c3. And the most natural move is bishop d2. But you actually have a, have a much stronger move in this position too um, to prevent knight takes c3. Uh, I would recommend taking 10 seconds to try to find this move. It's, it's very nice. Um, the rook on e1 isn't really doing anything. It doesn't have any uh, entry points into black's position. It doesn't really do anything on c1 because black can guard all those squares. But if we play rook b1, uh, now black can't take on c3 because b6 will be hanging at the end. Uh, so like knight c3 loses to takes, and you can't defend b6. You take here, I take with check, and I take on b6, and your entire structure collapses. I'll play rook takes b6, rook b5, and rook a5. Uh, completely winning for white. So king f8, bishop e1. Now Carlson remaneuvers his bishop to attack black's only weakness on b6. King e7, king g1. Um, normally, you want to bring your king to the center in the ending, which is something that uh, clearly Michael Adams was taught. But Carlson brings his king back because actually it's more of a tactical uh, vulnerability on e2 than anything else. So it's better on g1 than, than a different square. And the bishop comes to f2. It's more important to activate your other pieces than your king in this specific position. So knight b8, bishop f2, knight d7, rook e1, and rook d1. Um, so Carlson just repeated, uh, it's better to have your rook on e1. So rook e1 is a good move. Rook d1 is just because he wants to get closer to time control. This is move 38, and uh, he got to move 39. I, I would assume that move 40 is uh, time control where they get an additional hour or something. So he's just making sure that he doesn't lose on time. And then knight d6. So white goes after black's uh, bishop. Um, now, I, I will, in, in the game, Adams play knight c5, but I will give you the opportunity to solve this tactic. It is white to play and win material. Is anybody brave enough? There are two ways of doing it. Okay, hopefully you took some time to try to figure it out. The correct solution is bishop c5, or okay, it doesn't matter, knight, c, knight f7, it transposes, bishop c5. We take both of the minor pieces, and then we play bishop c4, and then rook d1. And after king, uh, king e6 and f4, black is going to lose the knight on d5. Eventually I'm just going to bring my king to e4, and the pin is not going away ever. This is a pin forever. Uh, black can try g5, g3, but um, it's just over. I'm going to bring my king to e4. If you stop me, I'll, I'll put my king, I don't know, like I'll play rook d3 and put my king on the queen side and win the king upon ending or something. So this position is totally lost. So instead, Adams played knight e5. Knight f7, king f7. The two bishops are very powerful in the ending, and um, more importantly, the b6 pawn is very weak. 
the rook d1. Uh, bishop takes b6 is already a threat because of the pin on the d file. So king e7 to stop bishop takes b6. Uh, here, sorry. Uh, white played f4 because the pawn on f3 wasn't so important, but this pawn on b6 is very important. If I get to take on d8 and play bishop takes b6 and bishop takes a5, I have two connected pass pawns on the queen side. And bishops work very well on an open board, uh, in addition to the fact that there are pawns on both sides of the board, making this a uh, completely winning ending for white. So knight, uh, knight g4, rook e1, king f8, bishop d4. So rook d6 was played. Um, now the knight can move with a discovery on the bishop. h3 and uh, rook d1. Now, uh, an even simpler tactic here. It is white to play and win material. So why can white not, I'm sorry, why can black not take on f4? That is correct. Bishop c5 immediately wins. If takes, then I take on d6, and black can basically resign. I'm playing rook a6 and rook a5. I'm up the exchange. Um, yeah, for 2800s, this is easy. So knight takes f, uh, sorry, knight takes f4 was not played. Knight f5 was played. Um, black is trying to uh, eliminate white's most important piece. So bishop f2, obviously. King e7. So now. Um, black can think about knight e3 or something. g4. Uh, yeah, knight, actually knight e3 immediately loses to rook e1. They ignore that last comment. It was total nonsense. Knight, uh, knight h6, f5. Yeah, the knight can't really move. I fixed the, the king side structure a little bit, and b6 is just going to be lost after bishop g2. So knight f7, bishop g2, knight f4, take, take, and bishop b6. Um, yeah, this position is totally, totally over, but I guess it's worth going over Carlson's technique anyway because it's very nice. Uh, he, he just gives this pawn away so that he can take a5. So you can't um, allow black to take h3, so you just take on a5. And uh, out of the two bishops, you might want to consider which one you want to keep and which one you want to get rid of. White, uh, white obviously. I mean, take 10 seconds to think about it. But the answer is the dark square bishop, because black's pawns are on f6 and g7. So in any ending where I get to play, let's not that move, bishop f8, um, I'm going to like win your king side pawns. And this pawn is a distraction. So if your king goes over there, then my king might come and win your king side pawns on f7. So king c5, bishop, uh, king g3, my mistake. And Carlson doesn't care. He doesn't care about his bishop on b5. He cares about the bone on, on c8, on c1. So bishop c1 was played, knight c4, take, and bishop a3. Oh, sorry, bishop d2. Better was actually just bishop a3. This is like plus four already, but what he did was like fine. It's like plus two. I assume they were in time trouble again. This is move 66. a5, and white just brought his king to the king side, and the game was over. All right, thanks. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for watching. Uh, this was Julian Proleko and Dennis Norman. I hope you appreciated this.